This is Caribbean Newsline, brought to you in association with the Barbados Tourism Marketing Incorporation. Grenada's Prime Minister Dr. Keith Mitchell is reporting fiscal growth in 2014. This is Caribbean News Line for Wednesday, November 26th. From the CMC Centre in Bridgetown, I am Nicole Best. Good evening. Mitchell presented a $1.15 billion EC dollar budget for 2015 on Wednesday. He says increased economic activity and improved tax administrations are among the reasons for the country's good fiscal performance. That's in the first 10 months of 2014. In terms of budget support, Mr. Speaker, for the homegrown program, we have already received $75 million. We anticipate receiving another $23 to $28 million by the end of this year. Mr. Speaker, recurrent spending has been restrained allowing us to invest significant more in our capital programs, which represents the good side of our budget. We are confident, Mr. Speaker, that we'll meet our targets under the homegrown program for the end of the year. Mitchell says he expects a 2% reduction in public debt to GDP ratio in the next fiscal year. He adds that the country has begun to repay its international debts. In 2014, Mr. Speaker, Grenada has already made debt payments of $245.6 million. This sum includes $207 million in principal repayments and $34.1 million were interest costs. The estimates of expenditure for 2015 will be debated in Parliament over the next week. Government is proposing to spend close to $460 million on debt, that is 40% of the budget. The second largest expenditure would be on education, $114 million, which is 10% of the total estimated expenditure. Finance and Energy will receive $90 million, or 8%. St. Vincent's Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez says he is considering approaching Ectel to purchase shares from Cable & Wireless for the average Vincentian. Gonzalez's statement follows Cable & Wireless acquisition of Columbus International earlier this month. He says, however, he needs to consider the size of Columbus International in the St. Vincent market. We won't provide the approvals here. The deal can go ahead in other places without us. Similarly, I noticed the data in relation to St. Lucia. The numbers are not so high. But yet we have to watch it across the region. And we are given a full hearing to cable and wireless. We are given a full hearing to Digicel and their objections. And we will make determination within the context of the legislation establishing the Eastern Caribbean Telecommunications Authority. St. Vincent's Prime Minister Rav Gonzalez says he does not know how Liat plans to streamline its operations. Gonzalez was responding to speculations about staff cuts at the airline. He says, however, shareholders are aware of the board's plans to improve operations and make the company more viable. Clearly, there are um, savings to be made on a proper utilization of human resources and it is the business of management to have a plan in that regard. The other matter on which we had already given instructions as shareholders is to, as part of the drive to make the airline more competitive, viable, 
is to reduce with a view to eliminate the, what you may call the social rules, the non-profitable rules. So you're dealing on the one side with expenditure and you're dealing on the other side with revenue. Liat announced recently that it will be reviewing its overall operations next year to ensure greater efficiency. Since the announcement, there has been speculation of staff cuts. But a recent statement from the airline says there is no basis for such speculation. The Jamaica government is calling for a bipartisan approach to the debate on the legislation allowing for the island to join the Trinidad-based Caribbean Court of Justice. Prime Minister Portia Simpson-Miller says Jamaicans are put at a disadvantage when they seek to go before the London-based Privy Council, which now serves as the island's final court. She is dismissing calls for a referendum from the opposition on the CCJ issue, saying the Privy Council is an institution of the United Kingdom government and it will not be in Jamaica's interest to be part of an institution that belongs to another sovereign country. But even as she appeals to the opposition, Jamaica Labour Party, for support, the opposition members were not present in the parliament. They are upset that the Prime Minister has not seen it fit to answer questions posed by the opposition leader Andrew Holness that were filed a week ago. The government needs the support of the opposition in order to obtain the special majority needed to pass the CCJ legislation. Prime Minister Simpson Miller says she is confident that if a referendum is held, it will work to the advantage of the ruling People's National Party, the PNP. But she says the parliament should not subject a decision concerning the judiciary and the highest level of the legal and judicial system to parties and politics. The debate continues on Friday. Over in Dominica, former Attorney General Bernard Wilshire and four others will return to court on February 5th after the state reinstated charges linking them to an alleged passport scam. The case was discontinued earlier this year after Magistrate Ali Gill struck out the matter for want of prosecution. But when the accused appeared in court earlier this week, they were slapped with several charges over the incident, which the state alleges took place between 2005 and 2006. Wiltshire is charged with conspiring to obtain a Dominica passport under the name of Eunice Abraham between June 2005 and September 2006. The Guyana government is warning its nationals to be wary of job offers overseas that are too lucrative to be true. The warning comes after five Guyanese nationals were rescued in Suriname. Guyana Embassy in Paramaribo confirmed that the five men were victims of trafficking in persons. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs says while it has been able to facilitate the return of the five unnamed nationals, it is urging Guyanese to be wary of situations where promises of securing the necessary travel documents and work permits are made. The Ministry says there have been several reports of similar cases. The police are investigating the matter. More news after the break. Pretty much at the limit of borrowing at the moment. What I'm hearing from, from you both here and, and the general feeling is that really and truly, what we're calling democracy is not being served in the region. You are supposed to be the servants of the people. The people are supposed to be your bosses. And to me, the people doesn't even realize it. This program is talk about the facts. We must bring the facts. This is time to taste the facts. Last Sunday every month, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m., right here on Carib Vision. Also streaming live on Time to Face the Facts Show Facebook page. It's live and interactive, so you too can join the conversation.
And as the Caribbean continues to battle the chikungunya virus, there are reports that research on the effective control of mosquito started in Trinidad and Tobago. But the professor who completed the research paper says the claims are yet to be acknowledged locally. Jovan Ravelo of TV6 News reports. The chikungunya virus has taken hold of Trinidad and Tobago. However, as the authorities continue to struggle to keep the epidemic under control, one UWE professor says the solutions to the problem are right here. Dr. Dave Chady has spent 12 years of his professional life in this lab on the first floor of the Department of Life Sciences, Faculty of Science and Agriculture at the University of the West Indies. Before he was at the St. Augustine campus, Dr. Chady spent 22 years as the entomologist at the Insect Vector Control Division, as director of the Trinidad Public Health Lab and deputy director of lab services at the Ministry of Health. The author of over 180 papers, some posted right outside the lab, all of it published internationally in peer journals, Dr. Chedi has written extensively on the subject of vector control, but no one in Trinidad and Tobago seems to be listening. I've had discussions with some people in vector control, Dr. Paris Ram, but um, none of it has actually been adopted. It's, however, these same strategies are adopted in, in the Indian Ocean Islands where the first chikungunya outbreak um, took place. Mauritius, Reunion, the Seychelles and Sri Lanka, some 16,881 kilometers away, are affected by the Aedes albopictus or Asian tiger mosquito. They're using my strategies and they have found it to be quite successful in, in reducing um, the chikungunya epidemics and reducing the mosquito um, densities. He says controlling any epidemic has to come from a scientifically informed position. Without the necessary understanding of the basic biology, the life cycle, the, the ecology, and the dynamics within the environment, it will be very difficult to effect a control program. Luckily, he's provided one such position. The research paper, Resting Behavior of Aedes aegypti in Trinidad, fed by research conducted between October and December 2010, guides the reader through a day in the life of a mosquito. From it, any vector control service can glean important information on how to stop the Aedes aegypti before the feeding frenzy. St. Lucia is now being told there are gaps in its national Ebola plan. A five-member health team from the Pan American Health Organization and the Caribbean Public Health Agency recently completed an assessment of the country's plan. They presented their report to the Ebola Steering Committee. More from lovely St. Amy Joseph of HDS News Force. We were quite pleased to, from the results of that assessment, that the Ministry of Health is quite on target in terms of the, the state of the, the national Ebola plan so far. Um, quite a few recommendations were also made in terms of us working on um, with some of our gaps. For example, the waste management at a lot of our facilities, um, they indicated that one of the gaps that we need to improve on, and they have also indicated that they will be given us support in terms of ensuring safe waste management at our facilities. They've also agreed to continue working with us in terms of ensuring the training of our health and non-health stakeholders. Dr. Belmar George indicates that St. Lucia had been working on its state of readiness for Ebola by following the guidelines from the CDC in the United States, which were adapted for the Eastern Caribbean. She says the visiting team was thorough in its assessment of St. Lucia's national Ebola plan and had free access to partners in the Ebola preparation effort. During the two-day visit, the team they met with the Ministry of Health. They also reviewed our plan. They reviewed our processes. They visited our hospitals. They also visited some of our other health facilities, such as the Grosjeune Polyclinic and also the ports. They had the opportunity to meet with our different non-health stakeholders as well to get their feedback in terms of their, their policies and protocols and they also conducted training for our staff as well. The PAHO CAFA team was headed by PAHO Barbados' specialist for disaster risk reduction. The Bahamas, that's over in the Bahamas, members of the Bahamas Electrical Workers Union strike for the signing of a new industrial action agreement. The members say if Bahamas Electrical Corporation Chairman Leslie Miller continues to refuse to sign the agreement, they are prepared to take further action. 
Under union leader Paul Maynard, they say they have given Miller enough time. More from Cleopatra Murphy of ZNS News. Members of the Bahamas Electrical Workers Union have ceased working overtime and are on work to rule until the Bahamas Electricity Corporation's chairman, Leslie Miller, signs off on a six-year industrial agreement. It was a chaotic scene at the Bahamas Electricity Corporation Tuesday as irate union members with placards in hand protested Miller's actions. They were joined by Bahamas Hotel Catering and Allied Workers Union President Nicole Martin in a show of solidarity. Union President Paul Maynard says the union has filed for a strike vote and is prepared to go even further. People got to realize in this country that I'm not unreasonable. And what we, we, we asked for, they asked for, we gave up, they gave up, we came to an agreement. It's done. We gave up more. All right? It ain't no do-overs. Maynard contends there are no changes to the industrial agreement they want retroactive to 2012. Employees have kept the same contract and have not received a raise in six years. The union has attempted to negotiate with Miller, but Maynard says one time Miller allegedly walked out and another time he did not show up. We agreed that all new employees, right, that come in after the, the contracting them, they have to pay, they have to pay a 30% for the insurance. And in 86, and in, I'm sorry, in, in 2016, if national insurance is implemented, right, we will pay 30% above the cap. Yes. We've agreed with that. Yes. We've agreed to sit down with, with, the, with the corporation with the and committee. with the pension committee with and, deal with the, and, and, and pay for our Everything. pension. The BEC staff union leader recently suggested that Bahamians would have a black Christmas if the contract was not signed. But as for concerns if the union is to blame for Monday's power outages, he says no. We ain't got time to sabotage. We ain't got time for that. But we can show you all that the system is archaic and what, what happens to the system. Miller, who was on property, had an exchange of words with union members and Martin, who said he must deal with workers' issues because they were there before him and would be there after. And while Miller says the union can do what it wants with regards to work to rule, he had his own question about their complaint about raises. Why don't you ask them what their current salary is? That's more appropriate. Maynard says the BEC staff union is not being unreasonable in its contract request and is acting responsibly. He says if employees do not put in extra work, Bahamians will see for themselves what occurs. Preliminary reports indicate the weather may have played a part in the plane crash that claimed the lives of renowned evangelist Miles Monroe, his wife, and seven others. A report released in the Bahamas earlier this week says the aircraft attempted to land twice but couldn't because of bad weather. When the weather cleared a second time, the aircraft was given the all clear, but even before landing, the weather deteriorated again. The report describes how the pilot attempted to visually find the runway during the second attempt and struck a tower, that's a towering crane, at the Grand Bahama shipyard. The cockpit voice recorder and the digital electronic engine control monitors have been sent to the National Transportation Safety Board in Washington, D.C. and Honeywell International in Kansas. Two Guyanese women in separate incidents were recently intercepted at a United States airport after attempting to smuggle cocaine into the country. Both women traveled from Guyana on Caribbean Airlines flights. More in this report from Neil Marks on Capital News. Last Friday, Trisha Ann DeGuerre was arrested at New York's John F. Kennedy Airport for trafficking cocaine. She traveled on a Caribbean Airlines flight out of the Chaddy Jagan International Airport. At the JFK Airport, Elsa, a trained detective dog, alerted officers to a black and brown suitcase. That alert signaled that there might be narcotics in the bag. The bag was allowed to go through the baggage claim area so law enforcement could see who it belonged to. When the girl picked up the bag, she was pulled in for questioning, and the suitcase was searched, revealing over six kilograms of cocaine in a plastic bag. The woman said she was expecting to be paid 10,000 U.S. dollars for the cocaine by someone she had arranged to hand it over to in New York. Trisha Ann DeGuerre remains in custody in New York. And now last Saturday, another woman, Frederica Coates, was also held at the JFK airport after arriving on the Caribbean Airlines flight from the Chaddy Dragon International Airport. At the New York airport, she was selected for a custom search. She had four bags, including a plastic bag with five hardcover books. 
An officer examined the books and found they were unusually thick, and so she was escorted to a private area, and as the officer checked the books properly, a white powdery substance was noted and later tested positive for cocaine. The amount of cocaine weighed at almost two and a half kilograms. Frederica Coates was arraigned on Monday and posted bail in the sum of 150,000 U.S. dollars. On Monday, Capital News reported that two Mondays ago, Wilton Sinclair was arrested in New York for fetching over 8 kilograms of cocaine in Rome. And ahead in Caribbean Newsline, the latest sport. Center View Hotel offers you the finest dining and conference facilities in St. John's. Come and savor the decadently rich flavors of both local and international dishes at the Sapodilla Restaurant. Enjoy meals down to perfection. City View Hotel, the place for the finest food, functions, and forums. Located on Newgate Street, St. John's. Call 268-562-0260. Or visit us on the web, www.cityviewantigua.com. Have you ever wanted to escape into a whole new world? Stacia's Marine Life has been described as the best kept secret of the Caribbean. Dive into the beautiful marine life of Sintu Stacia's with the guidance of a professional diver. Explore our magnificent underwater world. You can be acquainted with a wide variety of oceanic creatures like never before. Explore beautiful coral reefs and numerous reefs with an abundance of fish, lobster, and sea turtles. Don't you miss the opportunity to explore one of the most breathtaking underwater experiences throughout the entire Caribbean? Sintu Stations, known to many as the Golden Rock or the Caribbean's hidden treasure. Within this beautiful island lies marking history yet to be told. What better place to unravel all the unanswered historical knots than Stacia's very own historical foundation. Sintu Stacia's holds one of the richest histories known to the Caribbean. So don't you waste another minute. It's time to be acquainted with the island's traditional dances, delicious food, historical landscapes, monuments, and lastly, the unforgettable historical events that indeed make us the Golden Rock. Discarded West Indies pacer Tino Best is among four players called up by Barbados Pride selectors for the third round of Professional Cricket League starting Friday. They will replace four members of the team travelling with the regional side for the tour of South Africa. The others are former skipper Ryan Hines, Kyle Cobbin and Royston Chase. They replace Craig Brathwaite, left-arm spinner Solomon Ben and fast bowlers Kimar Roach and Jason Holder. Braffitt, Ben, Roach and Holder are due to leave the Caribbean on Sunday with the West Indies senior team for the three test series against the South Africans. All-rounder Carlos Braffitt will take over the captaincy of the Pride from Braffitt. West Indies all-rounder Darren Sammy's Titans managed their second win of the Ram Slam 2020 league on Wednesday with a 19-run victory over Dolphins. Titans opted to bat first at Wilmore Park and rallied to 176 for 7 off 20 overs. Kwasim Adams top scored with 76 from 53 balls, including 9 fours and 2 sixes. Opener Henry Davids chipped in with 32 from 31 deliveries. Sammy, meanwhile, smashed West Indies teammate Dwayne Bravo for 2 sixes in the last over of the innings to end on 15 not out from 5 balls. Bravo finished with 1 for 42 from 4 overs, while Seymour Craig Alexander led with 2 for 24. In reply, Dolphins plunged to 75 for 5 in the 12th over before Bravo came to their rescue with a top score of 34. Well, there are more questions over the future of football in Guyana as fans await the decision of the Normalization Committee on which tournaments will be run off at the end of this year. The committee was installed by FIFA following the removal of the old executive. It has been meeting with various associations to determine the future of the sport in the country. 
Royal Collins of Capital News reports. There has been much speculation in the air that the Kashif and Shanghai tournament will not come off, but all this is still up in the air. Capital News understands that four associations, Georgetown, Linden, West Demerara and Barbies have declared their intentions to run off their own tournament, with the East Coast and East Bank supporting the year-end tournament run by the Kashif and Shanghai organization. This newscast also understands that the Georgetown Football Association has received tangible commitments for its year-end tournament. Bank's DIH has been the main sponsor of that tournament. The FIFA Installed Normalization Committee, headed by Clinton Erling, has been meeting with various associations to chart the way forward in Guyana's football after the removal of the old executive. There's some applications there. We look at those applications. Um, we might not decide today. We might need some further investigations on, on the applications. And the committee will just decide which tournaments um, will run at the end of the year. Based on our assessment, yeah. Guyana Rugby Football Union says it is hungry for a win in the upcoming North America and Caribbean Rugby Association Championships. Guyana plays Mexico at the start of its campaign in this year's NACRA tournament, which begins this weekend. The GRFU president, Peter Green, says while Mexico is a high-ranked team, his side has a strong will to perform well. Mexico being a fully developed nation, millions of players have improved. We, at the same time, have that missing ingredient. We have been approved, yes, but we also have that thing that is called hunger and a don't give up mentality. That's what I'm gambling on. Guyana is a six-time NACRA 7. That's a NACRA 7. They did not participate in last year's tournament due to lack of funding. The new technical director of the Antigua and Barbuda Football Association, Piotr Nowa, takes up his appointment next Monday. The former professional pay player travelled with Antigua to the recent CFU Caribbean Cup Finals in Jamaica, but he formally, begins, he formally begins his duties now as he seeks to implement his plan of development for the country's football. 50-year-old Noah now capped 24 times for Poland during a career that saw him play professionally in Poland, Germany and the United States. Since his playing days, he has served as assistant U.S. senior men's coach, head coach of the U.S. men's under-23 side and head coach of the major league soccer franchises, that's the D.C. United and Philadelphia Union. FA Secretary General Gordon Derrick says streamlining national coaching standards will be a key part of NOAC's remit. And that's the sport. We'll be right back. This is Caribbean Newsline, brought to you in association with the Barbados Tourism Marketing Incorporation. Traveling the Caribbean has never been easier or more convenient. Go to liat.com for super savings on fantastic Caribbean destinations. Click on the specials page for the latest promotions and fantastic deals. Go to the quick reference button for travel tips and baggage info. Sign up for travel insurance, which covers your entire trip. And sample Zing, our in-flight magazine with news and features on people and places. Just go with liat.com. CMC presents Caribbean in 10. All the latest news for your weekly lunchtime, Monday to Friday, 12.30 p.m. on Caribbean. We are on Facebook. Join the growing Caribbean community today. Go to www.facebook.com forward slash Caribbean. Be a part of our online family, whether you are located in Canada, the USA, or even farther away. Caribbean is about what it means to be from the Caribbean, our culture, our lifestyles, our voices. Log on or switch us on. Caribbean. And that's the Caribbean uh, news line. Join us again at 6.30 for another edition. For all news and sports around the clock, log on to carnanews.com. Have a good evening.